Chapter 3. Displacement of Northern Free Blacks, 1820 to 1865. As Frederick Douglass was being beaten within an inch of his life, the enslaved teenager had learned about as much as needed about the labor economics of immigration surges while working with shipbuilders on the docks of Baltimore. He had been transferred from a plantation on the eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay to live in Baltimore with a relative of his slave master. He was hired out to work as a caulker in the shipbuilding industry at Fells Point on the bay. There, he encountered a workforce that was a highly mixed and volatile combination of European immigrants, free blacks, and black slaves. It was not unusual by then to find free blacks on work sites throughout the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast regions. Through gradual emancipations from slavery over a half century, the regions contained more than 100,000 free blacks by 1830. During a period of low immigration after the Declaration of the New Nation in 1776, the North's modest bands of free black artisans and domestic workers had managed to stake a fragile claim in the mainstream economy. But beginning with the nation's first immigration surge in the 1820s, it also was not unusual to find occupations increasingly dominated by European immigrant workers. From 1776 until the start of official record-keeping in 1820, it has been estimated that 6,000 foreign immigrants arrived in the United States each year. Numbers rose rapidly after 1820 to around 27,000 in 1828. Free black Americans began to lose ground, and even more so during European immigration spikes of around 60,000 a year, 1832 through 34, and more than 75,000 in both 1836 and 1837. In 1836, amidst labor surplus tensions up and down the East Coast, teenager Douglas arrived at the Baltimore shipyards. During his time there, European immigrant workers devised a plan to get rid of the free black workers on their job site by taking advantage of a tight deadline their employer was facing in building two large man-of-war brigs for the Mexican government. The immigrant carpenters staged a walkout, saying they would work no more unless the free black carpenters were fired, which they were. It was a power play by European immigrant workers that Douglas witnessed throughout his life, with his children sometimes direct victims of it in their adulthood. The Baltimore immigrants did allow black slaves, including Douglas, to keep their jobs so they could continue to earn pay for their masters. But the immigrant carpenters couldn't seem to stop thinking about how many slaves in the South might eventually be able to compete with them for jobs. Conditions eventually grew more strained for the slaves on site, Douglas recalled, with the whites complaining that the colored workers were taking over the country. Eventually, four of the men attacked Douglas with bricks, sticks, and hand spikes. He barely escaped with his life as 50 other workers watched the beating and shouted for him to be killed. For Douglas, who became one of the country's most visible and influential orators of the 19th century, his experience helped lead him to the belief that recently arrived immigrants were nearly as tenacious as slave masters and bounty hunters in trying to keep a free black man from competing in the labor markets of the North. In 1838, Douglas broke his bonds of slavery by fleeing to New York, which had ordered emancipation of the last slaves in the state in 1827. But Douglas soon saw that African Americans could not free themselves from the laws of supply and demand in the labor force. The ever-growing and unrestricted supply of European workers was steadily lowering the demand for black workers. While most of New York City's domestic servant jobs before the 1820s had been filled by free black workers, the majority of the jobs eventually were occupied by immigrants. And the reason for the shift was not that black workers had moved to higher-skilled and higher-paid jobs. Historian Adrian Cook pointed out, Employers preferred to hire immigrants, especially Germans, who would work long hours for low pay. Douglas wrote in the Baltimore Sun about the loss of occupations for free blacks. White men are becoming house servants, cooks and stewards on vessels, at hotels. They are becoming porters, stevedores, wood sewers, hod carriers, brick makers, whitewashers and barbers so that the blacks can scarcely find means of subsistence. A few years ago, and a white barber would have been a curiosity. Now their poles stand on every street. Formerly, blacks were almost the exclusive coachmen in wealthy families. Without the means of living, life is a curse and leaves us at the mercy of the oppressor to become his debased slaves. 
W.E.B. Du Bois later would note that the new immigrants proceeded to methodically drive northern black workers from their jobs of all kinds and to replace them. The largely unrestricted flow of immigration created a labor surplus in which immigrants regarded runaway slaves, ex-slaves, and free descendants of slaves as threats to their own tenuous livelihoods in the slums of New York. Violence was not an uncommon instrument to hold down the black labor force.